Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, as I said this morning, uh, I chose topics that were personally interesting to me, topics about which I put a lot of thought into, but uh, was still trying to um, come to an understanding or an opinion. And when it comes to this, this afternoon's topic, it really is huge. I mean, every question you answer leads to another question or group of questions. Uh, it's really a never-ending road. It's a very complex issue. So the title of today's talk kind of gives you the two aspects of it that we could focus on. Green jobs. Green meaning the environmental aspect of, of this policy and jobs meaning the macroeconomic effects on employment and income. Uh, I'm going to focus today on the jobs part of it. Uh, one of the questions I have really is, uh, are green jobs in some ways better than other jobs? Um, would we get uh, more overall impact on the economy if we focus on certain sectors, uh, the sectors of the future, uh, perhaps um, the, the basis for the next generation uh, of, of energy and industry? And Certainly many politicians from many different countries have bought into the idea that we, uh, it's worth pursuing an industrial policy in these sectors of the economy. Um, but we have to understand a little bit on the environmental side as well. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just briefly outlining some of the environmental issues, the green aspect of this. So feel free to interrupt with questions, or you may also be knowledgeable about some of these issues. You've been learning about them and studying about them in your various courses, and feel free to interrupt me with comments and uh, corrections, as the case may be. So let's, talk, let's start talking about energy and the environment. Why do we want to pursue alternative forms of energy? apart from any macroeconomic effects. What's the goal here? Well, one of the goals that's been stated is the idea of energy security or energy independence. President Bush, uh, in his final term of office, even though he's a Texas oil man, came across with the idea that we are addicted to oil. We need to change our pattern of energy so that uh, politically and uh, economically, we don't have to worry about how other countries feel about us, whether they like us or not. We, uh, we can provide for our own energy needs. Now, well, I'm not sure that most of the green jobs policies actually do much to provide energy independence. Uh, we'll get to some of this more later. But uh, frankly, for us to get energy independence, using some of these green jobs programs, I think, is an unrealistic goal. In fact, some of the easiest ways for us to get energy independence would require us to develop the so-called brown jobs in traditional energy sectors such as coal and uh, natural gas. So if energy independence alone were the goal, I'm not sure this topic would be uh, that controversial because I don't think I don't think we would put that much money into these industries. Um, there's another aspect of energy independence which puzzles me. And as an economist who, who believes in the idea of comparative advantage, I'm not really sure that it's that good an idea to cut yourself off from the low-cost suppliers around the world of anything, whether it's energy or bananas or shipping, why would you want to pay more for something than you have to? The idea of being energy independent for its own sake is kind of, to me, it's not that different from Michigan saying, well, we're going to be orange independent. We're going to grow our own oranges. And we know we're going to pay a little more, but at least we don't have to worry about, you know, somebody going to cut off our orange supply. I know it's a ridiculous analogy, but to me, it seems like these are some political issues that could be addressed in political ways. You don't necessarily need to uh, restructure your entire economy. The other thing about this is that you know, most of our oil does come from neighbors we have good relationships with, Canada and Mexico, for example. 
most of our oil comes from camp. They're the single biggest uh, supplier of our imported oil. So uh, it's not clear to me that um, you know, energy independence is a worthwhile goal. On the other hand, um, it is very important in many people's mind, and it has been put forward as a justification for uh, green jobs. Um, prevent climate change, I think, is probably the much more serious uh, of the two arguments in favor of subsidies for green jobs. I bet at this stage in your life you have heard at least a dozen, if not more, lectures on climate change and what the effects are. You may have seen Al Gore's slideshow, An Inconvenient Truth. So um, even if I were qualified, I wouldn't spend a lot of time going back over the science of global warming. I'm going to assume a little bit of knowledge just to remind you some of the uh, potential negative economic effects of climate change. Rising sea levels would destroy a lot of uh, oceanfront property. In some parts of the world, islands where people are now living and working would completely disappear if the sea level rises high enough. Um, even places which aren't uh, flooded permanently will be flooded frequently as the incidence of hurricanes, more droughts in uh, certain parts of the world would, would be tough on agricultural production. And of course, there are the environmental effects, uh, the effects of uh, glaciers melting and ecosystems changing and uh, certain kinds of sensitive species going extinct, perhaps, and coral reefs uh, being damaged and, and so forth. There's also the potential for some nasty surprises. We don't know if uh, climate change and the damage from climate change will be nice and continual and gradual, or whether there will be sudden reversals in ocean currents or other things. Uh, so there's a chance that uh, the damages from climate change could be uh, perhaps worse uh, than we want. So the worst case scenario uh, could be pretty bad. Now, how confident are we about the science of global warming? Uh, I think probably more confident than we were 10 years ago. I used to be a climate change skeptic. There are a couple questions to be answered. Number one, is the earth warming? Number two, is our man-made emissions contributing to this? And I'm no scientist, and it was difficult for me to interpret all the literature from both sides that were coming out. But a number of people that I respect over the years uh, Ronald uh, Bailey and Bjorn Lomberg, uh, they began being somewhat skeptical and have since moved over to a, uh, a point where they tend to agree with the um, International Panel on Climate Change. They may not agree in every respect, but they agree on two fundamentals. We are getting warmer, and human activity has something to do with it. The National Resources Defense Council estimates costs if, we, if nothing is done, if it's business as usual. By the year 2100, they estimate that uh, damages from these kinds of events will um, reduce our GDP by anywhere from 1.8 to 3.6%. Uh, that's significant, obviously. That's a lot of uh, damage. Now, of course, it's not going to come on all at once. Uh, we're talking about a... a 90 years from now, um, but it's going to start to occur more frequently and increase in intensity till the end of the century. This is where we are. Any comments or anything to add about climate change or the science of climate change? Yes. I think you can make that argument, and there are many reputable scientists who do make that argument. Uh, and again, it's one of these things where it's a controversy. It hasn't been settled. So certainly the changes we're seeing are within the, that kind of natural variation that we've seen. I mean, obviously, um, 
you know, where we're standing today used to be covered with ice, right? So we've seen drastic changes in climate. One of the questions is uh, how fast do these variations occur? And some people say, well, what's happening now is occurring a little more rapidly than it's happened in the past. And we have to worry about that. If climate change happens gradually, then ecosystems have a good chance to adapt and, uh, in a way that reduces the damages and the cost. If it happens more quickly, that, that's where we run into problems, I think. Any other comments? <laughs> well, that's one of the things that I hope to address a little bit later, and that, like climate change science itself, is also controversial. There are a lot of claims made by groups that are not disinterested. There's a lot of industries who benefit from the current policies, just as there are a lot of scientists, I guess, who benefit from the... Uh, the, the alarmism of climate change science. So it's a question of who do you trust? Um, as far as the claims are concerned, um, at this point, I think we're still dealing with uh, sub, well, for example, in the United States, $64 billion are the subsidies that were um, part of the um, stimulus package that was passed under the Obama administration. $64 billion is a lot of money. But it is uh, definitely an order of magnitude less than these damages. So if you compare costs and benefits, um, I think if I were to say a consensus would say that this is worth preventing if you can prevent it. Um, there are some people that question whether or not you can and whether or not our current policies would be enough to do that. Okay, so bottom line is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of economic uncertainty, a lot of a scientific uncertainty. Uh, one of the catalysts to um, promoting green jobs and so forth recently was an economic study done by the economist Nicholas Stern in England. He uh, suggested uh, in his economic analysis uh, that the damages from climate change were definitely going to be uh, much higher than, than previously thought and uh, therefore he recommended that uh, we move now quickly and drastically to prevent uh, further emissions. Uh, that's, you see more and more studies like that coming out. All right, so the question is, how do we cope with climate change? Assuming that we should do something, even if we're not certain. We might not want to wait until we are certain. Because if we start to act now, and if we start to take some real steps, uh, the cost, perhaps, of preventing climate change will be a lot lower. Uh, if we introduce new forms of energy now, as China and other developing countries are, are growing and uh, industrializing, if they're using clean energy, well, isn't that a lot better than if we have to wait 10 years from now? And, um, so we could reduce our carbon emissions by introducing alternative forms of energy and more conservation. Another potential set of solutions, which is controversial, but a lot more cost effective, geoengineering. This means changing the planet. Now, there are a lot of interesting ideas here, but uh, so far this has taken a backseat to carbon reduction as a politically favored strategy. And I guess you can see why. I mean, when you start manipulating the planet, you start manipulating the environment, there are a potential for all kinds of unintended consequences. I'm reminded of when the, uh, you know, the stories of how the farmers in Australia brought rabbits in to raise, seemed like a good idea at the time. Some of them got loose and now the country's overrun with rabbits. They have a hard time controlling it. So once you start introducing changes into the natural environment, uh, people are concerned that you might lose control over that. Um, but just to give you an example of what could be done, algae blooms in the ocean absorb carbon dioxide. But a lot of the ocean doesn't have a lot of iron content. So uh, 
the iron that you put in the ocean actually uh, somehow fertilizes the algae blooms, uh, gives them, um, I guess, the, the, the oxygen, or I'm not sure exactly how it works, but basically it, it allows the algae blooms to grow more rapidly in more places. You could do this at various parts of the ocean without disrupting the ecosystem, its proponents say, and this could act as a carbon sink. So we can continue with business as usual, producing a lot more carbon, but the atmospheric carbon level would not rise because so much of it is being captured by our oceans. Another inexpensive way to deal with climate change or to prevent it would be to increase cloud cover. And one of the ways we could do that is by spraying seawater into the air. You could just put that, those particles into the air, those salts. It would make uh, thicker, whiter clouds which reflect radiant energy coming into the atmosphere. And that thicker cloud cover would act uh, as a, uh, a, a sunscreen, in a way. Um, there are many others that have been proposed as geoengineering, and, uh, but there hasn't been a lot of really solid modeling uh, on those solutions. So those are kind of in their infancy. Um, adaptation. What does adaptation mean? Well, adaptation says, look, if you're going to have a hundred years before you have to deal with all these hurricanes, if it's going to emerge gradually, then maybe we could do some things to protect ourselves from the worst effects. Right? If you knew, for example, that hurricanes are going to be more likely, maybe we don't have to build or develop land as near the ocean as we used to. Maybe we could take steps to protect low-lying areas of the coast uh, building up our system of levees and so forth. Um, so that's part of it. If we know what's coming, maybe there are low-cost ways of, of dealing with it. Uh, this is certainly true of developing countries where we have the income we need to, to use substitutes the, for the way we're doing things now. Um, you know, we, we have the resources. Uh, some people argue that developing countries they don't have the resources to adapt. If a drought hits a country where most of the people are farmers and their crops fail, there's not a lot they can do. And we're looking at uh, catastrophe and mass migrations and, and things like that. So adaptation might be a strategy uh, that makes more sense for the United States, for example, than Ethiopia. OK, any comments or questions or additional? Strategies that you're aware of? Yeah. You were talking about the creation of human made clouds, you know, to reflect the sun. Mm -hmm. How would that affect growing crops and farmers? Mm -hmm. Well, presumably we'd have a, a stronger hydrological cycle, so there'd be more rains and um, I guess more cloudy uh, days. Uh, that's the idea. So uh, I'm not exactly sure how it would affect uh, agriculture, um, how it would affect the water supply. Uh, and I think they're still working on that science, but there may be answers to that question that I'm not aware of. Okay. So, let's take a look at energy prices today. These are levelized energy prices. If you take into account the cost of construction plus the cost of operation, um, plus the cost of delivery of the energy to the markets where it's needed. This is what our Department of Energy has come up with. And uh, there are many different sources here. The first one, it might be too small for you to read. That's hydropower. Obviously putting dams in the rivers and using the energy from the water to uh, uh, run a generator. Bi biomass. These are things like... Uh, corn ethanol or other kinds of eth ethanol made from switchgrass or something like that. Geothermal. This is using the temperature under the Earth's crust in one way or another to either heat or cool our homes. Uh, solar cells to produce electricity. You can see here the most expensive at this point. Now proponents of this particular form of energy argue that the cost of solar cells are going to come down rapidly as 
production is expanded and because of economies of scale, they're just waiting for the demand. If we can sell enough of these things, we can bring the cost down and uh, it'll be more competitive with some of these others. But certainly now, it's the least competitive one on this chart. Wind. Uh, there are many wind projects uh, that could be built offshore. Um, there's some talk here in southern Michigan, uh, Lake Erie, and some other places. Of, uh, there might be places windy enough to put these windmills actually in the lake uh, off Cape Hatteras in um, the northeastern United States. There's a project uh, in, the, in the works to install windmills. And uh, many countries have already done this. In Denmark, they have many offshore windmills. The water there is shallow. The wind blows a lot. And so it makes sense to put windmills there. But I'm sh how many of you have seen a windmill here? OK. In Michigan? One in Bay City. Oh, there's one in Bay City. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, some people say about windmills that uh, they're ugly. Uh, they obviously have to be very tall to catch the maximum amount of wind. People who live close to windmills have complained about the shadow, the flicker of the windmills. Uh, environmentalists have complained that the windmills have been destroying birds. Apparently, uh, birds have discovered that uh, under the windmill, you're relatively safe from predators. Hawks and other predators can come in, and if they miss those, uh, if they forget about those, uh, blades, they can be chopped up, and so, um, but that's a tempting target underneath the windmill for them to go after. So um, it, it all depends on the speed of the windmill and the size of the blades and so forth. But it's not as though windmills, in fact, I would say none of these are, are free, are completely free of environmental trade-offs. Windmills take a lot of space, right? Uh, so Offshore wind is pretty expensive so far. Wind on land is relatively economical by comparison. Nuclear energy, as you can see here, pretty competitive. Of course, what happened in Japan has obviously uh, given a lot of governments pause. Uh, Germany, for example, decided it wasn't going to license any more nuclear facilities. and uh, it, it shortened the life of some of its existing nuclear facilities. Uh, I know that Obama had talked about expanding our nuclear program. I'm not sure where he is with that today. But the fact uh, the tsunami created such a, a, a bad nuclear accident in Japan means that, uh, at least for the time being, we're not going to advance uh, much in the way of nuclear power. Um, natural gas. This is exciting, actually, because in natural gas, there's gas found in shale, rock beneath the surface, that has uh, virtually doubled our known resources of natural gas. Compared to some other coal, uh, fuels like coal, natural gas is clean burning. It's relatively easy on the environment, but it does emit greenhouse gases. It's a fossil fuel. But it is a relatively inexpensive and compared to coal and petroleum, a relatively clean fuel. And we have lots of it. And we're finding more of it. China has just found uh, tremendous supplies of shale gas. So shale gas looks to be uh, like it could be a game changer as far as these industries are concerned. Uh, it could be much more economical and much more abundant than we thought. Coal with carbon sequestration. That's a, I hope I said that right. When you bury the carbon, you capture the carbon emissions after you've burned the coal and you bury it deep inside the earth to keep it from getting into the atmosphere. That's carbon sequestration. And um, that's very expensive to do, but it can be done. And you can see it's a lot cheaper than solar power, for example. And uh, we have lots of coal in the United States. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry much about energy independence uh, through our shale gas and our coal. and um, if we develop some of our other sources, uh, it seems to be um, part of that portfolio that would, would do the trick. Obviously, regular coal is cheaper. And right now, uh, that's where our capacity is. Most of our electricity does come from coal. And uh, we've got an industry um, built around our existing uh, coal mines and 
It's made right here in America, and there's a lot of people that heavily support it, but there's also a lot of people that are absolutely opposed to it. Coal is a relatively dirty fuel. Uh, there are toxic emissions that, that uh, result, mercury that gets into the upper atmosphere and falls in various places. And um, the coal, I would say, that is being burned in the new plants, the newer plants, is extremely clean compared to the traditional dirty uh, coal that you might uh, associate with, you know, pictures of London covered with smoke and, you know, uh, coal has uh, been cleaned up quite a bit in recent years, but it's still dirty compared to the others. Green jobs is taking the, the political world by storm. Governments all over the world are devoting billions of dollars to develop their own sources of renewable energy. Um, here in the United States, we've been subsidizing various kinds of energy for years, for decades. I'll talk more about this later. But you can see the amount of subsidy that we're using today. Clean coal right now is receiving the, the highest amount of subsidies per unit of energy. And that's how these subsidies are calculated. Per unit of energy obtained, how much of the cost of that energy is covered by the subsidy. You can see solar, is and solar and wind are heavily subsidized as well. If you look at the difference here between, let's say, wind and nuclear, you can see what is politically favored at the moment and what is not. Okay, rather than try and talk in more detail about the energy picture, um, I'm going to show you a slideshow which is available from the Department of Energy. It's uh, part of the United States government, and uh, you guys paid for it already through your taxes, so you might as well see it, make use of it. It's a very brief presentation. I'm getting an hourglass here, Dale. I'm not sure why. From renewable energy. Renewable energy sources. Geothermal, solar, wind, hydroelectric, and biomass, including wood, organic waste, and biofuels, play an important role in our energy supply. In 2009, Americans used renewable energy sources to meet about 8% of our total energy needs. Over half of our renewable energy was used to produce electricity. In 2009, renewable sources accounted for 10% of total U.S. electricity generation. The largest share of the renewable generated electricity was from hydropower, followed by wind, wood, biomass waste, geothermal, and solar. Wind generated electricity increased by 61% between 2007 and 2008, and by 28% between 2008 and 2009, more than any other renewable source of electricity. From a global perspective, China leads the world in total renewable energy use for electricity production due to its recent massive additions to hydropower production. China is followed closely by the United States, Brazil, and Canada. The United States leads the world in the use of non-hydropower renewable energy for electricity production, followed by Germany and Spain. In general, most renewable energy power plants have less environmental impact than fossil and nuclear power plants. So why don't we use more renewable energy? Renewable energy power plants are generally more expensive to build than coal and natural gas plants. The best renewable resources are often available only in remote areas, and building transmission lines to deliver power to more populated areas is expensive. Three kinds of policies aim to increase the use of renewable energy, tax credits, targets, and markets. A federal tax incentive, the Renewable Electricity Production Tax Credit, 
has encouraged an eightfold increase in wind energy capacity since 2001. Many states have a Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS, which requires electricity providers to generate or acquire a certain percentage of electricity from renewable sources. By 2010, most states had an RPS, Renewable Energy Mandates, or Renewable Energy Goals. Another important feature of some state policies is a Renewable Electricity Credit Trading System. This mechanism allows an electricity producer who generates renewable electricity to either trade or sell certificates of generation to other electricity suppliers who do not generate enough renewable electricity to meet their RPS requirement. Looking to the future, the share of renewable generated electricity in the United States is expected to grow. The U.S. Energy Information Administration projects that renewable generated electricity will account for 17 percent of total U.S. electricity generation in 2035, up from 9 percent in 2008. This growth is driven mainly by the extension of federal tax credits and the new loan guarantee program in the February 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. EIA projects that renewable energy will be the world's fastest growing source of electricity generation through the forecast period to 2035. Much of the increase is expected to be from hydropower and wind power. For more information about renewable energy and energy in general, visit the U.S. Energy Information Administration website at www.eia.gov. Or, um, I know that at this point you, you probably are just trying to concentrate, but uh, what were some of the facts about the U.S. energy portfolio, the, the combination of resources that we're using, the trends in our use of those resources, the advantages and disadvantages? What were some of the things that you caught from watching that brief presentation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How expensive is that to transfer that energy to a transmission line? They said it was expensive, but like how much relative to how much like gas is there? Well, that slide we had earlier where I had the relative cost of those, the levelized cost, um, that, that's supposed to include access to the grid, if I understand those estimates correctly. But it is extremely expensive. So you do have to be careful when you're reading a particular uh, report and it's comparing the cost of wind power, for example, to coal power. Um, a lot of times those reports will use uh, assuming access to the grid is instant or it's right there, but uh, that's not always the case. We are going to have to modernize the grid and extend it to places uh, which, you know, really there aren't very many people. And so to deliver it to where there are people it's going to be a huge increase in our capital investment. Another um, problem with the wind that, that wasn't really spoken of, I think, in the presentation, was and solar as well, it's intermittent. And our ability to store energy or to get rid of excess energy that's being generated at this point is limited. So uh, wind has to be supported if it's going to really take care of our capacity. It has to be supported by backup systems. Now, if we were going to include the cost of the backup systems, as well as the cost of the production and transmission, then it could get really expensive. Any other comments or questions on that? Okay. So here are a couple of questions that are worth asking. Before we invest in all these uh, alternative sources, um, is it actually going to work? I mean, could these sources replace some of the dirty energy that we're using now? And uh, will it be enough to have an impact on global warming? 
And another question we could say is, is this the cheapest way that we could achieve that impact? Or could we achieve our goals in some other way that might be uh, less expensive, less costly? Yes? Is there any information on what our supply is remaining of, say, coal and uh, natural gas and, and those items? Like, how long it's... You have a how many years? Yes. Yeah, I've got, I've, I've got some... Uh, articles that I can show to you after the lecture. Unfortunately, I don't have that number on the top of my head, but it is a lot. I mean, we're talking about dealing with our energy needs for well over a century here, uh, just with the coal resources and the natural gas resources that we have. So it's not a question of our running out of those resources. Um, we're just going to stop using them and leave them in the ground, apparently. If, if it wasn't for the uh, environmental concerns, we'd still have the energy independence concern. But the energy independence concern is a reason to pursue the coal alternative. So the fact is that, uh, no, if it wasn't for climate change, coal would be the darling, I suppose, of uh, those people that want energy independence. And uh, the electric car and some things like that would still be technology that would be pushed because it uses electricity, but that electricity could be made by coal. With the electronic vehicles, I heard an argument made that it's just trading one evil for another because the electricity used to power those vehicles is created through burning coal, which is still environmentally unfriendly. Correct. So in a sense, then, all that's doing is removing our dependence from foreign oil? Well, if you look at the total amount of carbon released by burning the electricity, let's say, that's used in the vault or something like that, um, it's still going to be much less than in a conventional automobile. So even if you are going to use electricity from a coal-fired plant, it's still a net gain in terms of carbon. The other um, thing that they point to over the years is that eventually we're going to rely less and less on coal and more and more on some of these others. So in the long run, uh, the trade-off will improve. Good questions. Okay, is it feasible? Here are some maps from the Department of Energy showing different parts of the country and the potential for using different alternatives in those parts of the country. You can look at Michigan on this map, and I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but this little crosshatch section there, that's got the potential for wind power development right up there in Houghton, Keweenaw Peninsula. Also, you see a little bit right here, Traverse City, you, somebody says they already have their windmills there. Well, that's uh, a good place for them. And uh, that's about it. As far as the Department of Energy is concerned, it's not such a hot spot for wind, which is odd because we're investing a lot in wind and we hope to be kind of the, the, the wind capital of the, the world as far as manufacturing is concerned. Um, but I guess we're not going to be the world's w biggest wind consumer. Yes? Okay. Well, uh, well, in this map, there's a little bit here. I don't see any in the thumb. All I'm saying is that according to the Department of Energy, and they've measured winds and so forth, uh, they don't see this as a really fertile ground for wind power or much of any other alternative. Uh, there is here geothermal um, potential, those are the white areas. Now, look at California by contrast, or the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this cross-hatched area, that light cross-hatched area, that's wind power potential. Um, this is solar, the cross-hatched area that's kind of colored. No, I'm sorry, the yellow parts are solar power potential. Um, oh, what is that red area represent?
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot to put the, uh, the key on here, and I'm not sure what this all represents. The point is that um, as far as, 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 far as um, alternative energy is concerned, geographically, some places are better than others. And the idea that we're going to replace the amount of electricity that we use here in Michigan with energy produced here in Michigan with these alternative resources doesn't seem to work. If Michigan had a goal of being energy independent, it's hard to imagine how we could do that using renewable sources alone. We're going to need more coal plants. We're going to need other sources, it seems, uh, based on this analysis. And what's true here is true of a lot of the rest of the world. There are limited areas where you can use these things. And in those areas, even, there are times when the wind is going to be blowing and times when it isn't, times when the sun will shine and times when it won't. Now, as that presentation showed you, renewables are growing rapidly. And you can see on this graph, this is, again, from the Department of Energy, the various sources of power. Um, 2009 right here, boy, they're growing like crazy. And in particular, look at wind. Wind seems to be the darling of the renewable uh, alternatives industry. And it's projected to grow rapidly. Now, we have to keep in mind, it's projected to grow rapidly because it's, such, it's so heavily subsidized. Biomass also heavily subsidized and projected to grow rapidly. Uh, solar's going to grow, but you see it's still not quite as dramatically. Now, we can look at this slide, and, and, and it looks like a lot of great stuff is happening, but then we look at this slide. This is the same time frame, but this is energy from all sources. The green slice is renewables. So even with all that rapid growth, those renewables are not going to be able to replace a significant amount of our generating capacity. It's going to be tough to get to 20% as sometimes a goal that's thrown around. Uh, it would be really tough to reach that goal. All right. Well, to get that what appears to be a relatively small amount of additional energy from renewables, the question is, is it worth it? In other words, I mean, if we do replace some of these other forms of energy with these renewables, is that actually going to have enough effect on carbon emissions to prevent some of these uh, worst case scenarios that Al Gore is worried about and, and many others? Europe has been pursuing this more aggressively than the United States. They signed on to an international agreement, uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, back in the 1990s, uh, they've started various schemes to control carbon emissions, and they're, they're, they're way ahead of us on this. And they have a goal of <coughs> reaching 20% of their energy portfolio with renewable sources, cutting back greenhouse gases by 20% from their 1990 levels, and doing all of this by the year 2020. So 20% 20 reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, 20% from renewable <laughs> sources, and um, doing this all by 2020. So it's their 2020 program. Uh, it's been a struggle. Um, they've made a lot of progress. Um, but the question was asked, how much is this going to cost? Well, it's already costing Europe. $210 billion per year. And the question is, what do we get for that? According to a study by Richard Toll, who's a climate change economist at the University of Amsterdam, now again, who knows whether he's right or wrong. There's so much uncertainty here. But he says that these efforts will reduce global warming by one-tenth of one degree by the year 2100. In other words, we won't notice the difference. $210 billion a year is an awful lot to spend for one-tenth of one degree. Wow. 
one of the countries within Europe that's often held up as a great model or a great example of going to renewable resources is Denmark. And as we've already mentioned, Denmark has gone after uh, wind power in a, a big way. They are really situated to take advantage of the winds and uh, they've invested heavily in it. They get about 20% of their electricity from wind power. They also, on the economic side, are the world's biggest uh, producer and exporter of uh, components for windmills. And so they've uh, created a, a comparative advantage in their manufacturing of these components. Unfortunately, they also pay the highest electricity prices in Europe. 39 cents per kilowatt hour. It's about four times the U.S. price. It's twice as high as the U.K. price. It's, uh, it, it's an incredibly expensive uh, way to produce electricity, even in an environment as favorable as Denmark. Now, why is the cost so high? Well, the wind blows mostly, mostly steadily at night, but night is when most people are not using as much electricity. So the peak production is during the worst, uh, the low demand part of the cycle. What they have to do with all that extra wind is they sell it and they're connected to the grid and Scandinavia and Germany and they sell all that excess, but they sell it to those utility companies at reduced rates. So in effect, they're not even covering their, their uh, fixed cost of production when they sell it. They're selling it below cost to these other countries. Um, it's also true that uh, they've got to import energy from those countries. So they're paying one price when they sell it to them, and they're paying a much higher price when they buy it from them. That's one of the reasons why it costs so much. And you can see, for them, they didn't have to worry about a backup system, I guess, because they were connected to the European grid. They could rely on the backup system provided by these other countries. But imagine if these other countries were to go to this. Then where would the extra supply of electricity come from? It's not clear. OK, at this point, uh, I'm about to start talking about US policy. And this might be a good time for a short break. Um, I'll probably take two short breaks. But before you go, I want you to um, read an article or take an article with you, which uh, uh, sometime, at some point during the break, I'd like you to read. So if I could have some help passing out that Wall Street Journal article. You're about to read about a program here in Michigan that's created jobs in Greenville. Electrolux Vacuum Company used to produce vacuum cleaners in Greenville. And uh, all those folks that used to work at Electrolux lost their job. Electrolux outsourced its manufacturing and uh, just couldn't compete, I guess, in Michigan. And so the government was very concerned about finding jobs for these workers. And so they, uh, they managed to persuade uh, a new company to move in. And, and this is what the article is about. So take five minutes or so during the break. And when you come back, um, let's talk a little bit about this article. Have we been doing? this. How long have we been creating green jobs? Well, actually quite a long time. Um, when I was in college, I remember Jimmy Carter was president. And uh, he uh, created a whole new initiative for electricity generation. And, and uh, I remember him appearing on television when he was announcing the new 50 mile, 55 mile an hour speed limit. That was one of his energy programs. We're going to save gas. How? We're going to drive at 55 miles an hour on the highway. He appeared on television wearing a sweater. Oh, I wish I could do a good impression like John did yesterday. So I, my fellow Americans, you notice I'm wearing a sweater. I've turned the thermostat down a few degrees. And by small steps like this, we together can save X number of gallons per year. And he, he, this is uh, our president on TV 
urging Americans. Now, what was going on in the 1970s? Sorry? The energy crisis. What made it a crisis? Well, you're right. I mean, that's what turned it from some uh, a problem to a more serious problem. But ultimately, it was this fear that we were running out of oil. There were, uh, in this case, um, because of the revolution in Iran, the oil prices and the supply of oil from the Middle East had been disrupted. Gas prices rose. The government put price controls on those gas prices, so long lines formed at the pump. There were actually murders and violence that broke out while people were waiting in line. Some people wanted to take cuts and so forth. Well, the first thing, or one of the first things that Ronald Reagan did when he took office was to eliminate the price controls. And what happened was, at first, prices went up. And then what happened? All of a sudden, oil companies in America found that they had all these untapped supplies of oil that at a market price were worth developing. And they had potential oil fields and new supplies that they were thinking about developing, but, you know, kind of risky at the old price, but the new price will do it. And there was a golden age, well, we call it a golden age, of oil exploration and discovery. And basically, oil prices started to move down and continued to move down. So a lot of those programs that were developed during the Carter administration kind of died on the vine because oil was so darn cheap in the 1980s. But we have been subsidizing these uh, alternative sources of energy for quite some time. 187 billion, well that's of course less than what Europe is spending in one year these days, but even so, that's a lot of money, especially after taking into account the effects of inflation. Notice that the money is not always spent uh, on what we would consider to be clean energy. Look at this one, $28 billion for fossil fuels. I guess they wanted to find more fossil fuels fast. They were worried they were running out. $28 billion for renewables and conservation. Here's a good example of what we were doing in those days. The Great Plains Coal Gasification Plant was, at the time, the biggest construction project in the United States. It cost $2.1 billion to build. It was supposed to produce clean energy from liquidized, or, uh, liquid coal, or not liquid coal, but gasified coal. And um, sold in 1988 for $85 million, which, if you're good at math, you probably can verify this is four cents on the dollar. Boone or boondoggle? This was definitely a boondoggle. Why? Because the market shifted on them. And it turns out that there were cheaper alternatives. And uh, if you had simply taken that money and invested it in safe bonds, you could have, it would be worth $9 billion today instead of the $85 million that it was worth in 1988. Now, how efficient were the other programs? We don't want to use just anecdotal evidence, but what about some of these other projects? Well, um, this graph represents the results of a survey that was done by the Department of Energy on a number, using a number of different experts in the energy industry. And they asked them, what were the really great breakthroughs in energy and energy technology over the last 20 years? And they came up with a list that represented a consensus. Oh, yeah, these were the things that were really important. And then they said, okay, how many of these were developed as a result of the subsidies? And the answer came back, well, this blue. There were three, I think there were, um, I can't remember how many projects were studied in, in general, something like 20 projects, three of which relied heavily on the government subsidy. One of these was refrigeration. Uh, a more energy efficient refrigerator was developed as a result of a research sponsored by the Department of Energy. Uh, moderately important. Government made a difference, but it wasn't critical. It would have been developed without support. And unimportant or uninvolved. Most of the projects. So it looks as though 
energy technology and entrepreneurship in this market does occur with or without a subsidy and in many ways more effectively when there is no subsidy and the profit motive is the only reliable incentive. <clears throat> so why do we do this? Why have we done it for so many years and why are we getting ready to expand it to such an extent? And I think again it has to do with what happened in Greenville. People were losing their jobs. They didn't know where help was coming from. And here was something that promised to do two very good things, clean the environment and create jobs. This was an idea popularized in a book by Van Jones, who President Obama later appointed to be his uh, environmental czar. Uh, I don't know why they give these people names like a czar. We n they're nothing like a czar. Um, but the energy czar, Van Jones. He's no longer uh, in the administration. There was a little bit of controversy about his past. I can't remember what it was. But in any case, he wrote this very influential book, One Solution, Two Problems, The Green Collar Economy. And this caught on. So in 2007, I remember uh, John talking about this last night in his presentation. President Bush signing into law the Energy Independence and Security Act. Among other things, it raised the corporate average fuel economy standard from 27 to 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020. It also effectively banned the incandescent light bulb by the year 2020. Uh, the efficiency standards for the light bulbs are such that only those newfangled uh, fluorescent or LED light bulbs are going to qualify. So those old-fashioned light bulbs that you grew up with are being phased out. Um, there are some other uh, subsidies for ethanol and, and biomass requirements uh, to include that in the formulation of gasoline and so forth. Um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, this is part of the overall stimulus package, almost $800 billion in total, of which $64 billion was targeted towards these uh, green jobs. It's not just the federal government that's been heavily involved, it's the state government. Uh, as you already know, obviously, Michigan's been heavily involved. When Governor Granholm had her official portrait taken when she was leaving the office of governor, there's a port oh, I should have shown it to you on my slide. There's a portrait of her in her pantsuit, standing with windmills behind her, looking into the future. And this is the way she wants to be remembered, as the alternative energy governor. And she did work tirelessly to try to create uh, this uh, environment that would attract green jobs to Michigan. Obviously, um, one of the key policies that states have been using is to force their public utilities to purchase a mix of energy from alternative sources. So even though they might be able to produce energy more cheaply, many of them have been asked to or required to um, include a certain amount of renewables in their energy mix. Now, in some cases, they are allowed to raise their rates and recover the cost of this. In some cases, they are not allowed to raise their rates. They simply have to absorb the loss associated with buying more expensive energy. <clears throat> okay, tax credits and incentives are also used uh, by several states. All right, now, a few issues we need to settle before we really get too far with this. One of the issues that's very difficult but needs to be defined is what is a green job? Under the um, stimulus package, a lot of companies are trying to justify their particular access to the public purse by claiming we are green jobs related. We produce green jobs. Well, what do we mean by that? How, how can we tell the difference between a job that's green and one that isn't. Here's the, def the definition that the state of Michigan gives. What do you think? Is that clear?
Dale, I believe, was talking earlier today about holding virtual conferences with people around the world and getting the technology together so those guys didn't have to fly to meet in one place. Is that a green job? Well, you make a case. Now, the United Nations uh, has a standard for green jobs that goes way beyond environmental concerns. Uh, wait a second. Ah, this is the United Nations, their version of a green job. It's not enough that it's improving the environment. It also has to be a decent job with adequate pay. So apparently these are not only green, but they're highly paid as well. So I guess by that standard, minimum wage jobs wouldn't qualify. All right, uh, so we need to d define what is green. What makes an industry green? Again, this is the state of Michigan. It's green if it relates to renewable energy. That's one possibility. Or it could be increased energy efficiency, getting more kilowatts out of the same amount of coal, for example, or the same amount of gas. Um, agriculture, natural resource conservation. I suppose if you uh, just set aside wetlands or something, um, maybe that's green jobs. Or pollution prevention, cleanup. Now, we'll just take a quick survey. Is this a green job? Urban farmers live in the market in which their produce is sold. So they don't have to put their produce on a truck and drive it halfway across the country using a lot of gas. So doesn't this conserve fuel? This is a green job, is it not? We have a member of our board of trustees who's trying to create an urban farm here in Detroit. Detroit has a lot of land that's not being used effectively for industry anymore or, or homes. Why not just plow that under and grow tomatoes? And maybe we could get a subsidy. He could write for a grant. So, I don't know. What about this one? That's pretty clear cut. No? This would count, by the way. If you're officially estimating green jobs created by the state subsidy, the sales staff, the support staff, this would all count as indirect employment related to the... So you're I'm not saying that. I haven't seen that yet. I'm just thinking to myself, if I were an urban farmer, I would write for a grant. You can get a government subsidy for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose. What about this guy? Yeah, he probably, probably counts. So when you're doing research and you hear about all these jobs that are being created, uh, you know, a lot of these jobs are not what we think of being directly related, but uh, only in support roles. What about a bus driver? Instead of having 10 people on cars, each burning gasoline, put those people on a bus. Is that a green job? Yeah, that's true. Buses are not that e That's true. <laughs> they have to have a certain amount of riders for it to actually be better than cars. Most of the time. What about this one? How many think this is a green job? How many think this is not a green job? Well, you are wrong. Because this is a green job, under the stimulus package, these grants, a lot of them have been written by educational institutions because what employers have said is, we'd like to create these green industries, but we don't have the to trades skills that we need. The uh, electricians and, and the other technically qualified people. So. 
if you can figure out a way to improve the qualifications of the labor force, now you need a GED in many places to get into a building trades program, to get the training you need to be qualified, and so getting your GED could qualify, and the person who helps you get it could write a grant to the government under the Green Jobs Grant and uh, be subsidized for it. Now, I'm, I'm, I like the idea of helping people to get their GED, but you can see why this might create some problems, both for researchers, because they're trying to figure out, well, did this create jobs or didn't it? And, and for the government, is this really um, subsidy worthy or not? Oh, I forgot about this one. I think this is a green job, but the government doesn't think so for some reason. I think people driving to the bank waste a lot of energy, and heck, online banking keeps them at home. They don't even have to take off their pajamas and get dressed. They can just, but that doesn't count. Okay. I mentioned earlier that it's at the federal and the state level and also worldwide. Just so you know, the, the presentation we saw earlier talked a little bit about this. Uh, China is in this in a big way, and um, the United States, though, is well into this. We are, we rank second on a per country basis, but uh, we've got a lot of company. Okay, so why do we do this? What is the uh, idea here? Well, these are some of the claims that you read uh, in the green jobs literature. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, as far as the economic effects, not just the green effects, but the economic effects. It's going to be great for our economy. Uh, one of the common arguments is that when you create a green job, it's not just good for the person you've hired, but it's good for the economy as a whole. There's a multiplier effect. And if you're going to produce windmills, then you need a certain amount of materials, you need a certain amount of truck drivers, you need a certain amount of uh, you know, electricians and so forth. You need all this stuff to produce that commodity. They also claim that subsidies are costless or that they pay for themselves. Basically because it's a more efficient form of energy, at least over time it will be more efficient. Uh, companies can switch to the more efficient light bulbs and save enough on their electric bill to pay for the light bulbs. You can weatherize your house and save enough on your heating bill to pay for the new windows or the new insulation. Another claim, subsidies are temporary. It's kind of an infant industry argument. Right now, these industries are in an early stage of development. Once they get a certain market share, then they're going to be sufficient. They're grown-ups, and they can survive on their own. Subsidies will lead to a net increase in productive employment. What do we mean by productive employment? These are not just jobs. These are good jobs. These are the kinds of jobs that are hard to find anymore, the kind of jobs that you know, open the pathway to the American dream for a larger number of people, good middle class jobs. Subsidies are necessary. If we don't do it, who will? So these are some of the claims, and there are others. Now, as an economist, when I look at these claims, um, it seems to contradict a lot of the lessons that I've been taught over the years and that I teach. And uh, so I want to examine each one of these claims, and I'm not going to come up with a conclusive answer. But I will come up with what I think is the logical, economic, critical thinking with respect to each one of these claims. We'll start with a good example. Cash for clunkers. Whose idea was this? Is this good for the economy? My wife hates economics, so she doesn't like to talk about economics. But when she heard about cash for clunkers, she came up to me and said, the government's going to pay people to destroy their cars? And this is supposed to help the economy? I think that's a very good common sense approach. How can you help the economy by destroying stuff? If that's true, then maybe we want global warming because there'll be more hurricanes than ever. Every hurricane is a great economic boon. Hey? 
It's cash for clunkers on steroids. Well, cash for clunkers is bad for the economy. The problem is that when you have destruction, it may not show up in the GDP because GDP only measures production. But the fact is destruction destroys living standards. Instead of having those cars on the road today, those cars are gone. Now when people are trying to replace their wheels, I told you I had a 95 Chrysler, I don't know what its life expectancy is. But now when I go to buy a used car, there are less used cars on the market for me to buy. And so I'm going to have to pay more for a used car, which means I have less money to spend on other things. It's an economic fallacy. Friedrich Bastiat called it the broken window fallacy. The idea that if a little boy breaks the window of the baker's shop, that little boy has helped the economy by creating demand for new glass. No, it's not. Because the baker now has to replace the glass, he has to economize on his purchases, and maybe he buys uh, uh, less clothing, which destroys the jobs of the clothing makers and the farmers who make the cotton from which the clothing is made and so forth. The key to good sound economic reasoning is including both the obvious benefits of the policy but also the costs which are less obvious in many cases. By the way, did cash for clunkers reduce global warming? No, it simply in accelerated people's purchase decision. The research shows that most of those people that bought cars under cash for cars were going to buy in the next couple of years anyway. They basically moved it forward. And saving one year's worth of emissions is not going to prevent climate change, I'm sorry to say. Also, the most common trade under cash for clunkers, an old Ford F-150 for a new Ford F-150. The difference in fuel efficiency, not enough to prevent climate change. Okay. It was pure polit uh, political motivated. So here's an example for a claim that's quite common in the green jobs literature. This is from the Center for American Progress. This is going to reduce energy demand, it's going to lower costs, which means that money spent now on energy efficiency will pay for itself. By the way, I recommend the Center for American Progress and even though I've kind of indicated that I don't agree with this particular reasoning of theirs, if you want a good source for pro-green jobs literature, they've got a lot of uh, articles and stuff which you may, especially if you're going to do research in this, I recommend their website. Zero cost argument implies one of three things the way I, I look at it. Number one, firms are not interested in saving money. They need to be forced into do it. Um, that doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. I just don't believe that firms are not interested in saving money. So second possibility is they're not aware that by operating more efficiently, by conserving energy, by substituting one kind of production process for another, that uh, they could be more profitable. Well, if they're not aware, then one simple and co relatively low-cost solution would be to make them aware. You don't have to subsidize anybody or pay anybody off. If you, you don't have to pay me off. If you tell me there's a $10 bill on the podium and I can pick it up after my presentation, you don't need to somehow bribe me to go over there and pick it up. I'm going to pick it up. Just let me know it's there. So an information campaign, an education campaign, those are the kinds of things that could produce real results if uh, in fact, these efficiency gains are out there. What if firms know about the potential efficiency of these alternatives? And what about if they know uh, that um, it's going to save them money, but they just can't get the financing? Well, again, this is part of a more general problem. If you can't get the financing, what's going on in your banking system? And I would say manage your banking system properly and uh, more firms, especially small, medium-sized firms, will have access to credit at reasonable rates. And if it really is a profitable investment, it seems to me that a lot of banks would be interested in financing it. In other words, I'm just not seeing how you can create a free lunch here. Um, there may be some cases. I'll give you an example. In California, 
There was a study done about home solar power. And as you know, there are many parts of California which are sunny most of the year. And if you install solar power panels on those rooftops, you can collect a lot of sunlight and create a lot of energy. Now, is it cost effective? Well, not if it's unsubsidized. But if it's subsidized, it's cost effective. And yet a lot of homeowners weren't using it. The subsidy has been in place for a couple of years, and homeowners aren't buying it. So what California did was it started an education program and actually it targeted homes. What kind of homes can benefit from this? Well, homes with high energy bills, so the bigger homes. People who have the credit and access to credit so they can pay for the upfront cost of installation. Well, these are your wealthier citizens in the community. So the, the wealthy people with uh, big homes, it had a marketing campaign targeted towards them. And in fact, a lot of them did purchase the solar power, and they didn't need to be, well, it was subsidized. But even so, uh, it seemed like the information was the, the trigger that they needed. So I won't deny that a lot of times people simply aren't aware and that we could do things to increase awareness. And I think we probably should do things to increase awareness. What do you think? We had, a, we had an Omniquest a couple years ago, which made the similar claim that um, that there's a lot of profits to be had in, in uh, becoming green, and, yeah. Say that subsidies are costless, but subsidies are, but the big government can give anything they kind of have to take in the beginning, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, right, it's up front, but it's recouped. So what will happen is, um, the claim is that if a company invests up front, it will recoup its cost within a short period of time. Yeah. It's free eventually. Now, here's another possibility. Another possibility may be that people in the private sector are simply operating on different assumptions. They may not be as optimistic about these cost projections as the proponents of green jobs are. They may not be as optimistic about the ability of companies to bring down the cost of solar power or to bring down the cost of wind power. They may be more optimistic about the ability to develop shale gas or other sources of, of clean, cheap energy. In other words, they may just have a different forecast. Now, why would you have a different forecast? Why would you think it might be costly to switch? Um, one of the things you've got to forecast is the relative price of green energy and conventional energy. And we know from history back in 1979 people didn't do this very well. People were predicting at that stage the price of oil would grow out of control. We're running out. And because they were too pessimistic about conventional sources of energy, they went overboard in investing in alternatives. Okay, but we know what happened. Energy prices for traditional fuels collapsed and that uh, many of these other projects failed. Green jobs proponents tend to, like the folks in 1979, be relatively pessimistic about the price of conventional sources and relatively optimistic about the price of their own green sources. Now I will admit this third point, I think, uh, basically says there's a self-fulfilling aspect to these forecasts. If because of the um, desire for alternative fuels, if because of that it becomes more difficult to site a new coal-powered electric plant, there's no new coal-powered electric plants being built. Well, the new ones are more efficient than the old ones. They're cheaper. If we could replace our old plants with new plants, they'd be cleaner, they'd be cheaper, energy prices would fall. But in fact, if we can't create enough support for building these additional plants, then of course they're not going to be built and the price of coal-powered generation is going to remain high. So in that sense, the forecasting may be accurate, not because it's based on real market circumstances, but more on the politics of citing uh, new sources. Any comments or questions on, on that argument? Okay, another claim. Yes?
Yes. And I'll add that this friend of mine is very liberal, and working there um, will, will openly say that it's a complete waste of money. Because once they train these people, none of them get employed. There is no employment for these people, right. there is no job. Well, that's a great uh, case study, and uh, you know, I'd like to actually learn more about that. Um, but that is one of the, the types of activities that's very successful in getting grants under the program. And there's no way this would, would happen if it were paid for through a market profit-seeking business. <clears throat> but then again, we might find anecdotal evidence. Again, uh, um, Capitalism at the Crossroads was an OmniQuest book that we covered a couple years ago. If you were here at Northwood during the time, there were a few examples given in the book of companies that actually did save more than enough money by investing in greener business practices. And uh, there are many consultants who do save companies money by basically doing an inventory. Oh, I see this is the way you're doing this. Have you thought about doing it that way? So it is possible under certain circumstances that, um, you know, to improve efficiency. But I think the it's exaggerated. If we're going to move in a big way to renewables, I think we're going to get into high opportunity costs very quickly, and I think we already are. Okay, do you need the subsidy? Historically, businesses have not liked to produce a lot of waste because disposing of that waste is costly, and also even waste can sometimes prove useful to somebody. There's a farmer in western Michigan whose dairy farm was losing money year after year and he was going to lose the farm. And he was racking his brain and racking his brain. He came up with the idea, well, if milk gets to this price, then I can make it. And he knew there's no way milk is going to get that expensive. I'm not going to make it. But he applied his creativity to looking at other sources of revenue, and he looked at the cow manure on his farm, and he said, hmm, I wonder if that could be worth anything. He'd just been getting rid of it, composting it and just leaving it. But in this case, he said, I can't turn that manure over quick enough to make it into fertilizer that's marketable and profitable, and um, I wonder if I could change the process so that I could process it quickly enough to make it into a profit stream. And sure enough, he actually managed to engineer a new process. He became a very profitable and wealthy uh, a dairy farm. And um, that's the way it happens. I got a waste product. It's not doing anybody any good. It's just garbage for me. How can I make it useful? Or how can I save on fuel? How can I save on energy? Here's a good indication of what the unsubsidized activities of entrepreneurs have been able to do with energy efficiency since 1950. This is energy use per unit of GDP produced. So it's kind of like the productivity of energy. Okay. And the less energy you use, the better, right? So in this case, we were using, uh, starting about 20 units of BTUs, that's a measure of energy use. We're using 20 units to produce a dollar's worth of GDP. Now we're down to 8.52 units of energy to produce a dollar's worth of GDP. We found a way to wring the energy out of the system. We found a way to conserve without subsidies to a large extent, simply because it's cheaper to use less energy. Now, why wouldn't we rely on the market and the market process to motivate entrepreneurs to find innovative ways of reducing energy use? 
I already talked a little bit about the new source bias in energy policy or regulatory policy. That new source bias might prevent energy from being used efficiently, right? You don't want any new sources of dirty energy. You don't want any nuclear power. You don't want to drill in the Alaskan wildlife refuge. Okay. That's going to mean more expensive energy. That's going to mean efficiency that we could have, but we've chosen not to. The other thing that's going on here is we are not allowing the market to operate as a free market. We have subsidies for all kinds of energy. You saw the previous slide. Even fossil fuel energy, we are still heavily subsidizing. In fact, the amount of subsidies that go to the fossil fuel industry as a whole is much larger than the amount of subsidies that are going to renewable sources. Right now in Congress, they're talking about taking back some of these subsidies. Now, are these actual subsidies? I use that word somewhat carelessly. These are tax breaks. These tax breaks were put into place, number one, because they're put into place for a bunch of companies to try and make American companies more competitive. But number two, they're put in place to encourage energy exploration and uh, profitability for the oil companies so they would invest in new sources of supply. If we take those away, of course, the fossil fuels will become more expensive. But if they became more expensive, what would happen to the profitability of alternatives? What would happen to the profitability of wind power? It would go up. And then you'd have natural entrepreneurial investment in those alternatives. If it was a level playing field, you wouldn't subsidize either source. And you would let the market determine which one profit-seeking entrepreneurs chose to develop, right? In fact, I find this is actually, the more you read the green jobs literature, the more you realize this is a philosophical and not an economic issue. It's all a matter of where does economic progress begin? Does it begin in the halls of Congress or does it begin in the mind of an entrepreneur working on a problem? Okay. One of the claims made for green jobs is this multiplier thing. We're going to spend $64, $64 billion on, on green energy, but this is going to generate much more than $64 billion in economic benefits, right? It's going to be a real um, uh, ex uh, snowball effect. We are going to get the ball started. It's going to pick up energy on its own accord, and it's going to generate an economic boom. Now, most of these forecasts, especially the optimistic ones that are talking about creating hundreds of thousands of green jobs and having it be one of the major industries in the United States as far as employment is concerned, these optimistic forecasts are based on an economic technique called the input-output model. And it basically works this way. You look at how much inputs are being used today to produce a certain kind of output. So, for example, uh, let's suppose if we were to think of producing a new car, how much steel is being used to build that car? How much electricity? How much uh, land or uh, building? And so forth. And then you ask a following question. All right, well, how many steel workers do you need to produce that steel? How many truck drivers do you need to deliver it to the factory? How many maintenance people do you need to maintain the stamps and the other equipment that's used to form the steel? And basically, by the time it gets to the car, how many people have connected with that process? It's a lot like, if you remember from Philosophy 110, the story of the pencil. How many people participate in the construction of a pencil? Well, that's the way an input-output model works. It says, well, gosh, if we could increase the production of pencils by 10 pencils, how many lumberjacks will that take? How many truck drivers? Now, here's a problem with the multiplier as a, conceived of in the input-output model. First of all, the input-output model assumes constant technology, a kind of a static view where if we're using these inputs, it must mean that they're required and they always will be. 
What if a company finds it's using a lot of labor and because of that spe specific skill, it's becoming scarce and those wages are going up? What if they decide at a certain point that they're going to switch from using labor to using an automated process because it's cheaper? Then the input output model will fail. Prices change. The price of inputs change, and as the price of inputs change, the amount used in industry will also change in proportion. Also, the I.O. models estimate gross job creation. Well, how about asking the question, if we make more pencils or if we make more cars, somebody's got to buy those cars. Somebody's got to buy those pencils. And if they're spending money to buy those cars, doesn't that mean they're having to cut back on some of their other purchases. And then the multiplier effect works in reverse. If in order to buy the car, say the cash for clunkers, for example, if in order to buy the car, I had to take some money away that I had been planning to spend on a home improvement project, well, what's the multiplier in the home improvement project that never happened and how many jobs were destroyed because I never went in that direction? And also, these models ignore deadweight loss. What do we mean by deadweight loss? You guys have some idea from your economics classes, right? Deadweight loss is a net reduction in benefits because we're replacing something, well, in this example, we're replacing something relatively inexpensive with something more expensive, and it creates winners and losers. Some people benefit from the subsidy. Taxpayers are hurt by the subsidy, but in general, you created a less efficient method of production and as a result you have uh, hurt the efficiency of the economy as a whole. Now a lot of what I'm saying about this is not unique to green jobs. A lot of what I'm saying here is just pure economics. You could apply it to any kind of government spending. Many claims are made for government spending. We need a new sports stadium. How many jobs will that create? We need a new uh, high-speed train. How many jobs will that create? Keep in mind Every time those jobs are created, there's also jobs destroyed because of the difference in spending priorities. Economists have tried to estimate what this multiplier is. Now, a multiplier of one would mean um, that for every green job created or every in a dollar of income created through this program, there would be one dollar of additional income in the economy. A multiplier of two would mean one unit of spending would create two dollars in new income and so forth. Robert Barrow of Harvard University and also the Hoover Institution at Sanford has estimated the multiplier for the United States at less than one. He's not, uh, his view is not the most popular but it's influential. There are other economists who estimate the multiplier at 1.5. Um, others will get it higher than that. The Obama administration, when it was analyzing the stimulus package, used a multiplier of, I believe, one and a half. But Barrow esti estimated that it was 0.8, which means every new dollar of government spending increases income by 80 cents. 20 cents is lost in, in translation somewhere. Now, how could this happen? Well, it can happen. In Spain, they have invested in solar power in a big way. They've also invested a lot in wind power. Their wind power has turned out to be okay, but remember solar, it's not quite there yet. And as a result, the cost of producing this kind of energy in Spain has been extremely expensive. The government has chosen not to pass that on to the consumers. So it's costing a lot of money to produce the energy. Consumers are not being um, forced to pay it. Who pays it? Well, the Spanish government's going into debt. What happens to governments that go into an unsustainable kind of debt, uh, especially in Europe right now where Greece and Ireland and some other places have shown what happens? Spain decided it couldn't afford these subsidies after a while and decided we've got to phase out this program. An industry that had boomed, Spain had more solar power per capita than any other country in the world, has suddenly collapsed because the government says we can't afford it and it can't survive without subsidies. Anyway, how many jobs were created by this experiment in Spain? Well, lots of jobs created in the solar sector, but for all that spending, there was less spending elsewhere in the economy 
And as a result, um, an estimate uh, is that it's a minus 2.2 jobs destroyed for every job created under the program. Deadweight loss, I know uh, you guys were probably wondering when I was going to give you a graph, supply and demand diagram. Well, here you go. Now our weekend is complete. Well, not quite, don't leave. When we say there's deadweight loss, here's how you show it on supply and demand diagram. Microeconomics 101, supply curve shifts to the right. Because now the, product, the, the, the uh, production increases and the equilibrium moves from this point to that point. We get a lower price, shows up here as a green price appropriately. So the green price is lower than normal. Green output is higher than normal. Okay. Now, as far as the producer surplus is concerned, because they get that subsidy, their producer surplus increases by this amount. They're um, getting the subsidy, the difference between these two curves, this distance here, that's what they get from the government in order to produce this extra stuff. Okay? The consumers are benefiting because the consumers are getting a lower price. This amount is what the consumers are getting in the form of extra consumer surplus. But the amount that the taxpayers are paying is this entire rectangle. The deadweight loss here is D plus H. I'm sure if you guys had a piece of paper, you could fill that in and shade it, and you've learned how to do that very well. But do you understand what it means? That triangle? It's like throwing wealth away, right? This is stuff that we used to enjoy or were capable of enjoying in terms of living standards that we no longer have in our society. Stuff that used to produce net benefits but no longer does. Are subsidies temporary? Will these industries mature? Um, who knows? There's some uncertainty here. Uh, we know that if the subsidies were to end any time soon, we'd be in trouble. For example, I have the results of a study here done by the uh, Wind Energy Association and the Solar Energy Research and Education Foundation. This study was done in early 2008, and they estimated if the investment tax credit for solar PV projects and the production tax credit for wind energy were not to be renewed, then together those industries would lose 77% of their jobs. Specifically, 57% of the jobs in the solar industry and 93% of the jobs in the wind industry would disappear if we were to stop those investment tax credits today. Jobs would fall in the wind industry from 82,300 down to 5,700 within a year. So we're not going to end those subsidies anytime soon. And with the industry groups lobbying hard for these subsidies and for these dollars, they're obviously uh, going to be a little bit dependent for a while as long as the money seems to be flowing freely. Reminds me a little bit of Airbus. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Airbus, the European consortium to build a jumbo jet or jet airplane. They were subsidized by a number of European governments for years and they didn't turn their profit until this century. They'd been, you know, they began in the 1970s and they just weren't profitable. Taxpayers footed the bill for that for years. And finally, uh, they, they, they have become profitable and they are competitive. The question is, okay, now that they're profitable, are the taxpayers going to get their money back? And how profitable would they have to be? in order to recoup all the losses they've incurred over the years. Now, I will say that's an example, I think, of a subsidy that probably is not going to pay off in the long run. But we do have some examples of subsidies that might. One good example is in Brazil right now. We have ethanol industries in Brazil where they burn um, or where they create biofuels from sugarcane. And that has been subsidized for decades, but now it is a boom industry in Brazil with oil prices high enough, Brazil has become a major exporter of ethanol, and um, um, it's saving lots of money on its energy costs because uh, it's become very profitable. So it can happen. The 
question is, you know, which industries will it happen and how long will it take? Um, as you saw in your Greenville example, most of the jobs created are temporary by design. I mean, they're involved in the construction, not the operation. And what does malinvestment mean? Do you guys know? Malinvestment means, well, um, to put it in a simplified view, uh, it means creating a bubble in some sector in the economy, an unsustainable increase in investment in some sector. Now, why would you create a bubble in some sector if it's being heavily favored? I don't know if you guys talked about the housing bubble in here or not, but the way that housing was favored in the United States contributed to the creation of the bubble. Uh, basically, you get an unsustainable growth in one sector at the expense of the other sectors in the economy. Uh, U.S. ethanol, Spanish solar. Well, here's the results of the Spanish solar bubble. The market for their solar panels from 2006 to 2009. This doesn't stabilize the economy, it destabilizes the economy. People who move into these industries and are working there lose their jobs when the industries are no longer sustainable. Uh, can, you get an, can you get a net increase in green jobs? I mean, a net increase in jobs, period, I should say. In the long run, I don't believe it's possible. In the long run, you may know that uh, United States unemployment rates are usually somewhere between 5 and 6 percent. And during periods of recession, and especially the severe recession, they will jump up for a brief period of time, but then they'll come back down. So now the question becomes, where will these green jobs come from? Will they come from unemployed workers? You know, this little equation here is just a simple reminder for us to remember that green jobs come at the expense of brown jobs sooner or later. They either come from brown jobs immediately if there's no unemployment or normal unemployment. The only way you can get people in those green jobs is by attracting them from the brown. No net increase in jobs. On the other hand, if there is unemployment, where did that unemployment come from? People laid off of their brown jobs. Because they're laid off of their brown jobs, you're going to hire them into the green jobs. They're no longer unemployed, but once again, we have simply replaced brown jobs with green jobs. We haven't created any jobs. It is a fallacy to think of jobs as if um, jobs themselves are, are, are created by uh, demand. That's not true. Jobs are not created by demand. Jobs are created by people who want to earn a living and are willing to trade their labor for whatever the market will bring. And if demand falls and the market brings less, then what happens over time is people work for less. And if demand grows, people work for more. But the idea is if uh, people are willing to work for a living at the market wage, then there will be jobs. So then the justification must be if you're going to take jobs for the green industry at the expense of the brown industry, what, just, what possible justification could you have for that? And the answer must be, well, maybe the green jobs are better, right? Maybe the green jobs are better. Um, I don't think that's true. In fact, it's the green jobs literature itself that kind of gives it away that it's not true. One of the claims that you see commonly made in the green jobs literature is this one. Um, renewable energy creates more jobs per kilowatt hour. Is that a good thing? If we're going to use 1,000 a, a kilowatts of energy, is it good that those 1,000 kilowatts that we've purchased create 100 jobs, or would it be better if it only created 10 jobs? What do you think? Now, a lot of people say, well, 100 jobs would be better, wouldn't it? In that case, let me ask you this. Why aren't you buying your corn from Amish farmers? If you bought corn from an Amish farmer, guess what? He doesn't use mechanized agriculture. His plow was pulled behind a team of horses. He's got his kids. Why do you think he has so many kids? He's got his kids out there helping him harvest the corn. 
It's a labor-intensive kind of industry. You could probably create 10 jobs for every bushel of corn compared to our modern mechanized industry. In fact, 100 years ago, that's essentially what Americans did. When they bought their food, they bought it from people who were using that kind of technology. And as a result, uh, more than half of Americans were employed in agriculture. Now, does that mean we were rich back then and if only we could? No. What it means is we were, on average, not very productive back then. As farmers became more productive, those workers switched from farm jobs to other jobs. And one person, and now we produce the food that we eat with uh, less than 5% of the labor force. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's much less than 5%. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Because it means, because of productivity, we are better off. We have higher living standards. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> oh, this is what I just said. Okay. Um, does anybody have the time? I need a little help. 344. Okay. Um, <laughs> why don't you guys uh, take a little walk? Uh, Let's take a 15-minute break. That'll bring us to 4 o'clock. I'll finish up at 4 o'clock uh, with my final points. And, um, or actually, I suppose, if you, if you could stand up, maybe we should just stand up and stretch. Let's stand up and stretch, and we'll take uh, that kind of break. And then we'll, we'll finish up by 4 o'clock. How's that? I don't know how you feel about the article. The claim here is made that Cheap solar panels from China would be a good thing for America. What do you think? Well, it kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier this morning, about the middle class and the American dream and, and so forth. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of jobs that used to be very competitive in America, but are less and less competitive now because uh, in this global economy, there are simply uh, people that have a manufacturing comparative advantage. Uh, for some kinds of manufacturing, we may still have that comparative advantage. For others, we don't. Uh, should we give up on the idea of trade and globalization as a way of creating jobs or protecting jobs of the old kind? What do you think? Yeah. It's, it's kind of a lot like going back to the Amish method of production and applying it to the whole country because you're definitely moving to a kind of nostalgic, old-fashioned way of thinking about producing things and you're going back simultaneously to an old-fashioned level of productivity. And um, what the key is, it seems to me, is first of all, you know, the American dream isn't disappearing. The first lecture that we had this morning give some pretty solid evidence that over the long run, we have been able to increase incomes across the board from top to bottom. And we will continue to do so. But here's where I think the problem is. By combining these two things, green and jobs, we make each one of those worse. If the goal is really to create jobs, then focus on the things that make American labor more competitive. Education, for example, and education reform. Right? Deregulation. Taxation that's competitive in the global economy. We have one of the world's most uh, um, highest marginal tax rates on corporate profits. So there are things that we could do. If we were just going to focus on jobs by itself, then we have much more efficient public policy changes that we could do. Also, what if we were to just focus on green by itself and not worry about the jobs part? We could do that much better. Subsidize basic research and energy as we do with our major research in institutions 
And uh, we might come up with that breakthrough. We might find a way to use nuclear power that burns its own waste, that burns radioactive waste and eliminates the radioactive waste storage problem and provides us with an infinite <coughs> supply of cheap energy in the future. I'm not saying that is what will happen. But there are ways in which to pursue those goals without combining them. And I think that's what we need to do as a policy. Jobs policy is jobs policy. Environmental policy is environmental policy. Focus on what is most effective in each. And let's not worry. Let's not allow um, our insecurity of the moment to change the way we think about our relationship with government. Dwight D. Eisenhower said that only our faith in freedom can keep us free. And that's the thought I want to leave you with from this Freedom Seminar. And I, I wish you well on your drive home and good luck with your research papers. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>